Hi guys, I want to give you just a quick slideshow that just, just sort of caps off some of the things we've been talking about from chapter 3 before the exam. So let's make it quick. Um, basically I want to go back to a slide from an earlier lesson where where I talked about the business of changing basis from an unprimed basis to a prime basis and how you could work that out in terms of matrices and so on. I just want to point out that the ammonia molecule bears a lot of resemblance to this system. So for example, instead of X and Y, you could um, consider up and down. So X could be like up and Y could be like down. And the uh, up and down basis vectors in the unprimed basis can still be thought of as 1, 0 and 0, 1. So that um, you can imagine writing these guys out as, as uh, linear algebra type vectors. Then also plus and minus, if you remember, were interesting directions in our ammonia molecule space. Um, plus was like up minus down, and minus was like up plus down. Now these guys were interesting primarily because they turned out to be eigenstates of the Hamiltonian of the ammonia molecule. In other words, these were states of well-defined energy. Up and down alone didn't have a well-defined energy because if you put the thing in the up condition, amplitude could leak to the down condition and so on with down back to up. But if you put the thing in the minus energy state, it would stay put in that state. Or if you put it in the plus energy state, it would stay put in that state. It would only acquire a, a time-dependent phase factor that depended on the energy of the state. But the uh, probabilities of getting up and down are plus or minus would, would stay constant. Now let's uh, let's remind ourselves in the old problem we could imagine expressing any arbitrary vector as a superposition of the x and y basis vectors but in this problem you could imagine writing any ket as a superposition of up and down um, in an exactly analogous way. Uh, similarly we worked out a T operator in the old problem that was diagonal in the primed basis and uh, had eigenvalues of 2 and 0.5. But in this problem, in the uh, ammonia molecule problem, there's a very interesting operator, namely the Hamiltonian, which turns out to be diagonal in the plus minus basis and which has eigenvalues of E plus and E minus. What that means is plus and minus are eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. Therefore, they're the directions in this state space where time evolution is most simple. You remember the time evolution operator is most simply expressed in the energy eigenvector basis. In this case, that's the plus minus basis. And in that basis, it's simply uh, project out the plus component of any ket, multiply by e to the minus i omega plus t, and then add to that what you get when you project out the minus component of any ket and multiply that by e to the minus i omega minus t. If you think about it, this is the procedure we've been using all year to evolve quantum states in time. We've been calculating the component of the quantum state in different energy eigenstate directions, multiplying each component by e to the minus i omega t, where omega was the energy for that component, and then adding it up. And that's exactly what this thing says to do. All right, so that's uh, just pointing out the similarity between two problems that we've encountered, the fact that really you could think of them as just different forms of exactly the same problem. Okay, what about measurement? Um, measurement is a process in quantum mechanics where you look at the system using a particular observable. You measure a particular observable. If you do that, the quantum state collapses to an eigenstate of that observable and uh, it's actually an eigenvector, if you will, of the operator that represents that observable. The measured value you get when you make the measurement is the eigenvalue of that corresponds to that eigenstate um, and the probability of getting a particular eigenstate is the magnitude squared of the amplitude of that eigenstate in the original state. So whatever whatever the amplitude was of that state of that eigenvector in the original state before the measurement, that's you square that number, take its magnitude and square it to get the uh, the probability. Now time evolution. Time evolution is something we've been doing all semester. There's nothing new here. It's just stating it in these uh, slightly more formal terms. 
The idea is each energy eigenstate or eigenvector evolves with a simple phase factor as time progresses. You just multiply each component, each energy eigencomponent, by e to the minus i omega t. If you have a superposition of energy eigenstates, then the expectation values of other observables are going to slosh due to the fact that different energy eigenstates get phase factors of different frequency because of the, the old Einstein relation. The time evolution operator is trivial in the energy basis, but it's complicated in other bases. In the energy basis, you just multiply each energy eigen, eigenstate component by the corresponding time-dependent phase factor. And finally, uh, since the amplitude of energy eigenstates only changes by a time-dependent phase factor, the probability of measuring a particular energy eigenvalue doesn't depend on time. Okay, As long as you don't measure anything else, uh, the amplitude of each energy eigenstate component is constant. Okay, Let's see how that works out in practice. Suppose we start with some arbitrary state that's a little bit plus and a little bit minus. And then we ask the question, what is the state going to be at a later point in time? Well, that's easy. We just apply the uh, time evolution operator to our state. Our state we write out as a little bit of plus and a little bit of minus. And you can see that what we get is what we've been doing all along. It's the plus component, e to the minus i omega plus t, plus the minus component times e to the minus i omega minus t. That's the state at some point in the future. If we want to ask what's the probability of measuring plus, then it's just the amplitude of getting plus squared, which is just a plus squared. And the probability of getting minus is just a minus squared. And those don't depend on time. So if you're measuring energy, if energy is the observable you're measuring, then, uh, then you get a time-independent result. Its probability is constant. So um, if you actually do the measurement, then the system collapses to either plus or minus if you're measuring energy. So if you measured the energy and you got plus, then the system would now be in a new state, which is just plus, e to the minus i omega plus t, with no minus component. And if you measured minus, then the system would collapse instantly to minus e to the minus i omega minus t with no plus component. Okay, That's the idea. Measurements are going to change the system. So anytime you make a measurement, the system is now in a new state, and you have to start over. What about if you measure up or down? Well, if you measure up or down, you've got to ask the question, what's the amplitude to be up, or what's the amplitude to be down, and calculate the probability based on that. Let's do that. We'll start with our uh, wave function at a time t, and we'll ask, what's the amplitude of measuring up? Well, if you do that, you multiply through by the up bra. You calculate up on plus, up on minus. It turns out to be 1 over the square root of 2. That gives you the amplitude of being plus or minus. And, uh, you can factor out the 1 over the square root of 2 if you like, and now calculate the probability of being up. Then you take the amplitude and multiply it by its complex conjugate. You see it gets a little bit ugly, but not too bad. Um, you can factor out the 1 over square roots of 2. You get a plus squared plus a minus squared, and then you get these other terms that have to do with uh, the cross terms. Um, notice that a plus squared or a plus could be a magnitude and a phase. A minus could have a magnitude and a phase. In I'm just allowing these guys to be complex. But whatever they are, the sum of the squares has to be 1 if we assume that the initial state was normalized. So that means that the probability works out to be something like this. You get a half times 1 plus the product of the magnitudes of the two amplitudes. And then you get a cosine of the difference of frequencies plus some initial phase which has to do with the uh, phase of the coefficients a plus and a minus. Um, the point is, the probability of being up is not independent of time. It sloshes back and forth with a frequency equal to the difference of frequencies of the two states, which corresponds, of course, to the difference in the energy of the two states. <coughs> the other thing we need to know is uh, what would have to happen if you wanted to stop the sloshing, if you wanted the sloshing to stop. I want you to think about that a second. And maybe you came to the same conclusion I did. Either the energies have to be the same, in which case the omega plus minus omega minus is zero, 
or either a plus or a minus has to be zero. In other words, the thing either has to be in the plus state exactly or the minus state exactly. Notice that if it is in the plus state, then the probability of being up is independent of time. And if it is in the minus state, with a minus is one and a plus is zero, then the probability of being up would also be independent of time, and it would be a half. So the probability of being up would be a half in either case, whether it was plus or minus, which is kind of interesting. Let's, uh, let's do a little demo and uh, see if we can visualize what's going on here. Okay, so this is a little demo I cooked up to try to help visualize what's going on here. Um, you can see that we have a, uh, a set of basis vectors here. These are the up and down basis vectors and the plus and minus basis vectors uh, for the ammonia molecule. At the same time, I'm going to show here on two different sets of axes, the, the up and down amplitudes and the plus and minus amplitudes um, for a particular uh, phaser that depends on time. And let me go ahead and show you what that phaser looks like. It's this guy here. It looks it's pointing off in some arbitrary direction. Notice it's got a minus component and it's got a plus component. The minus and plus components are shown here, but at the same time, it's got an up component, which is big, and a down component, which at this moment is fairly small. So I can, uh, <clears throat> I can change it. I can force it, for example, to be up, or I can force it to be down, uh, down. <laughs> I can force it to be plus, or I can force it to be minus. Now, the other thing I'm showing here, if, for example, if I show the up, Embedded in here, you can see the minus component and the plus component, or if I make it down, you can see the plus component and the minus component. But of course, if it's in the minus direction, then um, then it's all minus, or if it's in the plus direction, then it's all plus. So that's the way the thing works. Now, let, let's suppose it is in the plus direction. Let's go ahead and make it in the plus direction. Notice the amplitude to be plus is 1. The amplitude to be minus is 0. But you'll also notice that that is the same thing as up minus down. In other words, plus is up minus down. It also, you can see it here, plus is up but minus down. Okay, so they're all connected together. Now what happens when I turn on the time? When I turn on the time, the plus, vec the plus amplitude gets multiplied by e to the minus i omega plus t. That just means it gets uh, an imaginary part. That just means this phasor gets multiplied by that phase factor. The up and down get multiplied by the same phase factor <coughs> as long as they stay in this combination, up minus down. So this is up minus down times that phase factor. Now what happens if I, uh, let's stop the time, and let's, uh, let's look at minus. Now minus is the low energy eigenstate. Here I'm 100% minus, zero up, and that's up plus down. And again, if I turn on the time, up plus down gets multiplied by a phase factor. You can see that the energy is lower. It's moving more slowly. And this phaser moves around in space um, with that complex amplitude. No, the the uh, imaginary part is out of the plane, and the real part is in the plane, is basically how that, that's showing. But you can see clearly that the... Uh, the minus amplitude gets uh, just multiplied by a common phase factor. Now here's a question, what's the probability of being up? Well you can see that the amplitude of being up and the amplitude of being down have the same magnitude. So when you're in the minus state, the, the probability of being up or down is 50% uh, either way. <coughs> it works the same way in the plus state. If you go to the plus state, the amplitude of being up or down are equal. They happen to be opposite in amplitude, but they're equal in magnitude, so that means it's 50% <laughs> again. Now, what happens if I'm in the up state? Let's go to the up state, and now I turn on the time. Well, what's going to happen is the plus and the minus now have different frequencies. So you'll notice that um, you're going from a, uh, a case where they're out of phase to a case where they're in phase. When plus and minus are in phase, like they are right here, then that means up is 100% and down is 0%. But when 
plus and minus are out of phase. Let's see what goes on there. Wait for them to get completely out of phase. I guess that's right about, oh, I waited too long. Daggone it. Okay, now they're back in phase. We're back, now we're back up again. If we wait for them to get out of phase, I guess that's gonna be right about now. Okay, notice now we're completely down. Also, notice that the phaser is completely down, okay? So out of phase, plus and minus, gives you down. In phase, plus and minus, gives you up. So we'll see how that works here. That looks right about like that. So now we're up, okay? Now what happens if I just pick a, uh, a random vector off in some crazy direction and then turn on the time? Well, now I get some superposition of up and down, some superposition of plus and minus. The thing never gets completely up and it never gets completely down. There's always some amplitude to be the other way. Also notice that the amplitudes of these two guys are not changing. Remember, these are the energy eigenstates. No matter what goes on, all they do is spin. Their magnitudes don't change. So as time goes on, the probability of finding plus and the probability of getting minus uh, don't vary. But if you're measuring up and down, you'll notice that up and down do vary. Down gets big, up gets small. Then down's going to get small and up's going to get big. And it's all because the relative phase of the plus and minus components are changing. And that affects how much up and how much down there is. Um, now, let's talk about measurement. What if we're going along and we measure energy? Well, if we measure energy, then the thing's going to collapse into either plus or minus. So if I measure energy right now, for example, there's a greater probability of getting minus because it has a greater magnitude, and there's a smaller probability of getting plus because it has a smaller amplitude. But I can measure plus. It's not zero. So if I measure plus, boom, suddenly I get 100% in the plus state. And then we're back to up and down being equally likely. Now, if I measure up and down this now, you can see I could either measure up or down. Let's say I measure down. Then suddenly it collapses into the down state. But um, then the probability, notice that in the down state, the probability of getting plus or minus is equal. They have different phases, but their magnitudes are equal. Similarly, if I measure up, um, let's say if I go along and I measure up right now, then sw it, it switches to the up state. But it doesn't stay there forever because upstate is an equal superposition of plus and minus, and an equal superposition of plus and minus uh, is the same thing you need to get a downstate. It's just it's a question of what the relative phase of those two guys is. So if they ever get 180 degrees out of phase, then you're going to be completely down and zero up, like right there. Right now they're completely pretty much out of phase, and you're almost all down, very little up. Similarly, if I'm going along and I measure plus, boom, I go into 100% plus and um, I'm back to an uh, up and down or opposite. And if I measure down and then measure minus, now I'm in a minus state with a 100% minus and no plus and so on. So I hope that gives you some sense of how the... Uh, how measurement works, how time evolution works, the important role that the energy eigenstates have, and uh, sort of how it all fits together.